can only imagine that this uh, is a topic of interest to many people. It will be fun, the question and answers, to find what's brought you here tonight. And, and uh, listen, I know uh, that this is a hard topic to not hear about, uh, not just in football. This is not just a, foot, not just a football is issue, but um, in all sports and not just a male sports issue. Yeah, concussions occur in all sports. Uh, and they occur in all contact sports, and they occur both in men's and in women's sports, and they occur in all ages. It's hard to imagine that uh, in sports um, that concussions uh, have become so common. Listen, every newspaper, I mean, the New York Times, often above the fold, and in multimedia as well, I, I can't turn on the television, I can't read the paper, I can't look at any social media without hearing uh, a question or a comment about concussion. For those of us who are, have taken care of athletes with brain injuries for a long time, it's encouraging, if you will, that uh, there is a more of an interest on concussion and brain injury, but at the same time, this is where the science piece comes in, it would be nice if we understood this rather than have thoughts and opinions based on just social media. So perhaps tonight we can spend a little bit of time talking about the science. It's hard to do that, though, when you see articles like this in the paper. I mean, every year, 8 to 16 young athletes die from uh, brain injury in sport related to concussion every, every year. Many of those are preventable, which is why those of us in the brain injury business would like to see a higher awareness. Uh, and, and, you know, you see it in football, but remember, it's not just in football. It's in all contact and collision sports where young athletes have a tragic death. This is uncommon. But the teaching point, if you will, is that it is preventable. If you can do something to help with uh, identifying early, you might be able to prevent a tragedy. The trouble is this. All contact and collision sports involve a player getting hit in the head or getting hit in the body with the force transmitted to the head. Once again, not just football and not just men's sports. How many sports concussions a year in the United States, not counting professional sports? It's been a big number. People have talked about this being 300,000 sports concussions a year, which is a big number, and actually the number is wrong. And the real number for sports concussion is probably closer, if you will, to almost 4 million sports or recreational concussions a year. It's a big number, and there's two ways to look at this number. There are not 4 million people, young athletes, who have had sports or recreational concussions who have severe brain injury or are disabled. So most people get better. The trouble with sports concussions or all brain injuries is that not everyone gets better. So if there's 4 million a year, there will be people who do not do well. And I can only imagine that those of you here, because you're a coach or a parent or an athlete yourself, have known someone who has been concussed and struggled. So it happens every year. Even if it's not death or disability, there's a struggle, there's a prolonged recovery. It's our job to try to identify who those people might be. What are we talking about in terms of concussion? Here's some great dinner time conversation. A complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechanical forces. That sounds like you took all the bad words in the English language and put them together. Um, listen, basically, complex means that there is, a, there is a very complicated neurological cascade that occurs at the cellular level. There's a lot of, of ionic shift and excitatory amino acids. This is a complicated metabolic process. Pathophysiological means that this is not structural. This is a functional issue, although there's some microscopic structural changes. And trauma-induced, if you take a blow to the head or a blow to the body with force transmitted to the head, this is how you concuss the brain. Commonly with a concussion, there's usually a rapid onset of symptoms. Players look different. They may be dazed, confused, amnestic, lose their balance, be uh, sort of sensitive to bright lights, for example. Um, and this usually happens and it gets better. That's the usual story. The symptoms with a concussion are very broad because it depends upon what part of the brain is injured. So if you injure the part of the brain associated with balance, then that may be the part that doesn't work well. What's important about sports concussions is you have to understand that being knocked out is not a prerequisite for being concussed. As a matter of fact, less than 10% of all sports concussions actually involve the athlete losing his or her consciousness. And if they do lose their consciousness, it's almost very briefly. So one of the myths of a concussion, I must not have been concussed, I didn't get knocked out. It's very rarely the case, actually. What happens to the brain when that concussion occurs? 
these chemical changes, part of the brain which is injured loses its sort of membrane uh, stability and uh, there's a movement of ions back and forth and this causes the, that part of the brain not to work very well and it can be very regional. You have to fix that. So when your brain doesn't work well, you need to fix that. And fixing that takes fuel. The brain doesn't store fuel. So the term fathead is actually medically incorrect. You don't <laughs> store fat as fuel in your brain. So the only way the brain can get fuel to fix this ionic imbalance is with delivery of glucose, which requires blood to flow to the brain and deliver glucose. That gives you energy to fix the cellular uh, imbalance. The trouble is that the part of the brain that needs the glucose, the part that is injured, actually has less blood flow. So this sets up a problem. You've injured the brain tissue and you can't get the fuel there to fix it. And what happens is this mismatch in fuel supply and demand results in the brain tissue being vulnerable. And it's particularly vulnerable if you hit it again before it recovers. And this is particularly true in youth. And very unique and sometimes tragic things can happen to young brains who take a second blow before they recover from the first blow. So therein lies the challenge and the struggle to make sure that athletes are better from concussions before they get a second concussion. And the other issue is that to fix this, it takes time. And there is no shortcut for how much time this takes. There's nothing you can do to make this recovery occur faster. In, in sports, we often talk about, well, you know, we'll, we'll do something. It doesn't help folks to ice your head. It does not make you better faster. And guess what? This improvement, this recovery, takes longer in kids than in adults. So two issues here. Kids' brains are more vulnerable to second impacts, and they take longer to recover. So what is a three- to five-day recovery in a professional athlete is usually at least a seven- to ten-day recovery in young athletes. So the trouble starts when people say to me, yeah, but I saw so-and-so go back. Yeah, but so-and-so is 28 years old and you're 14 years old. So one way to think about this is if your brain's a computer, the concussion is really a software problem, not a hardware problem, and that pictures of the brain show structure, not function. So, you'll, well, I went to the emergency room, I had a CAT scan, the CAT scan was normal. Just because the CAT scan is normal doesn't mean you're concussed. So normal imaging doesn't mean normal function. So this is a clinical diagnosis. You can't take a picture with traditional imaging of what a concussion looks like. So that's... A normal scan doesn't buy you out of concussion. How common is this problem that we're talking about? If you look at a concussion rate, an athlete exposure is not what you think it is. An athlete exposure is one practice or one play. And so let me ask a question of the group. The most common, the most common concussion, the most frequent rate of concussion in high school sport, what high school sport has the highest rate of concussion? That would be an easy question. That would be football, American tackle football, has the highest rate. But just so you understand, the rate of concussion in high school girls' soccer is almost as high as it is in high school boys' football. The rate of concussion in girls' basketball is actually fairly high. And what these numbers show, which is kind of interesting, is that if you look at girls' soccer as compared to boys' soccer, at least in this study, the rate of concussion in girls' soccer was 60% higher than it was in boys' soccer, and in basketball it was 300% higher for girls and for boys. In every sport that is comparable, the rate of concussion in female athletes is higher than in male athletes. A lot of reasons for that uh, in terms of maybe uh, body mass, geometry, learning to play, skull geometry, learning to play the game. Um, part of it may be that um, young female athletes actually may be more likely to report their concussion than their male counterparts, proving <coughs> once again that girls are smarter than boys, um, as though it, that was not obvious to everybody in this room. So um, it's common, actually, and it's not just in boys' sports. An effective concussion program, and this is the part I would really like to emphasize tonight, you have to understand that with professional sports, I mean, we have physicians and athletic trainers on the sideline. We have a whole system to evaluate and manage all kinds of injuries, including concussion. 
but at the middle school and high school level for the level for the great amount of time, there's no medical person on the sidelines, certainly not at practice and oftentimes not during competition. So the key here is to understand and be aware that concussions can occur and if you find an athlete who's concussed, to take him or her out. Just like you do if you think someone's having chest pain and shortness of breath, you call 911 because you don't want to miss a treatable injury. The same thing is true here. If you suspect there's a concussion, just take the athlete out. This is the job of the people in this room. If you're a coach or a parent or a student athlete yourself, if you think one of your teammates or an athlete for which you're caring as a coach or you see a, a young person stumbling with signs and symptoms of concussion, if you would just take them out and not that, let them return to play, then we will save lives and disability every year. Our job, Dr. Kincan and Kaufman and myself, is this part, to make sure that we're good at evaluating concussions, make sure that we evaluate, treat, and make the re right return to play decision correctly. This is a medical decision. Return to play after a concussion is a medical decision. What can you do as coaches and parents? If you see someone who looks different, if they appear dazed or stunned, if they're not sure of the score, if they don't move correctly, if you've noticed a change in an athlete that you know, and no one knows an athlete like their teammates, coaches, or parents, they may be concussed. If the athlete herself says to you, you know, I have a headache, I'm a little dizzy, I don't like this bright light, these are all signs and symptoms consistent with concussion if they took a blow. If you see these, take the player out. That would be a huge step forward in the public awareness piece. There's a lot of materials. This is, for example, is, a, is materials from the CDC, which is co-branded with USA Football. This comes as a freely downloadable uh, piece from the CDC. You can put this on a clipboard, carry it when you're a coach. There are the signs and symptoms. There's your action plan. There's the numbers to call. So listen, if you are with an athlete and he or she takes a blow to the head or another part of the body and there's force transmitted to the head, if you recognize that the player doesn't look the same, Take a look at your signs and symptoms card, and you can go to cdc.gov slash concussion. It's all freely downloadable. If you think the athlete's concussed, just take them out. If we did that, we would save lives every year, and it's easy to do. You have to understand that in terms of same-day return to play, as I've said, younger athletes recover more slowly, and it takes time. An athlete who's concussed doesn't look the same at five minutes as he or she does at 15. So if there's any question at all, the safest course, these are young athletes, we're talking about pre-adolescents and adolescent kids. We're not talking about professional athletes. So when in doubt, sit them out. If we could get this saying to catch on, then it would be a nice way for everybody in this room to help. You have to also understand that no more is a player with a diagnosed or even a suspected concussion allowed to return to play or practice the same day at any level in sport youth, high school, collegiate, or professional, there is no same day return to practice or play. And this is based off of work which was just done in 2008 and, and, and has been done and proven and adopted subsequently. The other thing I tell you, audiences is that when you have an athlete who um, plays sports or in high school or middle school, there's an adjective that comes before the word athlete. And that adjective is student. They're not just athletes, they're student athletes. And I understand that it's bad to miss three weeks of soccer, and you would think your life is over if you've missed three weeks of soccer and the tragedy and the trauma in every household. But not only are you missing soccer, you're missing other things as too. You're missing schoolwork and homework and social development and driver's ed and TOLO, if you're lucky enough to get asked, uh, and things like SAT testing. You can take a one- or two-week injury in a, in a high school student and make it a six-month injury by mismanaging it, by allowing that athlete to play. Even if there's not the tragedy of death or terrible disability, you can prolong symptoms from concussion. It's like having the flu every day. So all of a sudden, grades fall, social development falls. I have several young athletes who have to repeat a year in school or take summer school simply by trying to play through a concussion and prolonging the symptoms. Rest is the only solution. When in doubt, take them out. What we do, 
you have to understand that when there's a concussed athlete comes to see one of us, uh, there are several factors that, that make us think about return to play. How bad was this injury? How many concussions have you had previously? Everybody worries about this. How many are too many? How close together were they? How severe were they? It's not good when you have a concussion from a blow in a sport that shouldn't be a big blow. Heading the soccer ball doesn't cause concussions. If heading the soccer ball causes concussions, that athlete shouldn't play soccer. So it's bad when you're celebrating with your own teammates and you get a concussion from the celebration. When you bump heads together, that's probably a sign that maybe you're a little more sensitive. As I've said earlier, the younger you are, the more susceptible. What's the sport? If the intent of the sport is collision, you have to be a little more concerned. Unfortunately, athletes who have learning disabilities don't recover from concussion as quickly. The tragedy there, folks, is that oftentimes young people with learning disabilities excel with athletics, but they take longer. The same is true with athletes who are depressed or anxious. Oftentimes their self-esteem is on the field of play, but they take longer to recover. So our job, and I think what you should demand as consumers, is that your health care provider understand enough about concussion to do a good history and physical and help you make decisions to keep young athletes safe. Even kids who have migraine headaches don't recover as quickly. Who here uh, has taken a baseline concussion examination, an impact test or axon test where there's a computerized test, the concussion test as is often discussed on television. That is a test that measures some aspects of performance, how well you remember and recognize things, your speed of processing information, what is called executive uh, functioning. And that's gained a lot of popularity. Well, I'm going to take the concussion test, and I can take it again after I'm concussed, and I'll, I'll know when I'm not concussed. I want you to understand, since this is a science conversation, that unlike a litmus test for acid or base, neuropsychological testing is not a litmus test for concussion. It is one tool that we can use to help make the diagnosis, but you should not be swayed by the fact that you can take a simple test on a computer and then retake it after your concussion, and if the test is normal, you are normal. It's one piece. It is not a standalone test, and it is not a litmus test for concussion. What do we do? What, what are our jobs? Not only is physical rest necessary, but sometimes cognitive rest as well. So now we're talking about do you go to school, do you do your homework, do you rest from school? A big part of our practice is saying if you do things physically or cognitively and it reproduces your concussion symptoms, you will prolong your recovery. We have to make sure that the athlete really is symptom-free at rest before there's any exertional activity. And then just because your concussion symptoms are better and you're fine at rest does not mean you're ready to return to play or practice. There is a gradual, progressive exercise and strength training challenge that we do over five to seven days, if not longer, before the athlete returns to play. So as a consumer, your job or as a parent, take the athlete out. Don't let he or her, him or her play until you're sure that there, uh, if there's any question of a concussion. Our job, look at the concussion, diagnose it, treat it correctly, and when symptoms are gone, reintroduce schoolwork and physical activity to a point where we know that the athlete can handle that challenge before he or she is returned to the field of play. People ask me all the time, how do we prevent the long-term effects from concussions? This is one big way. It is really a problem if you keep playing and keep getting concussed or if you play with symptoms from a concussion. Even if it's not fatal, it can be a problem. Premature return to play can do bad things. It can take a small bruise in the brain and, brain and turn into a blood clot in the brain, which is often fatal. It can take a young athlete who has that vulnerable part of their brain, and you can hit that brain again. And this is Brandon Schultz, uh, who is, has survived what's called second impact syndrome, a nice young man from Anacortes, and make your brain swell dramatically in young people. Almost always fatal. But even if you don't have these terrible things happen to you, it can affect schoolwork, social development, academic development, and this is important in young people. There are common concerns. You have to understand that concussed athletes statistically have a much higher risk for recurrent concussion. So if you've been concussed three or four times, your chance statistically for another concussion is higher, maybe 400% higher. 
the health care provider needs to help you with that. Athletes who have recurrent concussions often have more symptoms and their concussions last longer. Sometimes if you've been concussed enough times, you don't actually recover from your concussion and it's like having the flu every day for the rest of your life, which is a frustrating thing and often preventable. And I know everybody in this room is worried about the cumulative brain trauma issue. You know, how many concussions are too many? I don't want to be that punch drunk fighter. Just so you know, we don't know the answer to this. It appears that most concussions probably are safe. We don't know the, the risk stratification exactly for chronic brain injury. We do know certain things, though. The younger, the more concussions, the closer together concussions, playing with symptoms from a concussion and not recovering fast are all warning signs that help us stratify risk. So once again, our job is to make sure that young athletes are completely recovered between episodes, and then we will work with them at the Seattle Sports Concussion Program to see if they are at too much risk for their sport. Absolutely, with a concussion, you must remove an, an athlete from practice or play, and you can't leave them alone because you don't know how bad the concussion is until it fully develops. So if you're a coach, assign someone to sit with the athlete. Do not leave them alone. Do not send them to a locker room without an adult uh, with them. Everybody who's concussed should be seen for a medical evaluation. This is a medical issue. This is a, you know, so find someone who can help your athlete who's concussed. Return to play after symptom-free is done under medical supervision in a supervised stepwise progression. And it really does need to be complete recovery before return to play. The younger the athlete, the more conservative the treatment, without question. I wish there was a simple test. There's no neuropsychological test. There's no blood test to prove that someone's concussed. We don't grade concussions, a one, two, or three. Those, those grading systems are often based on loss of consciousness, which is not a great predictor for how severe a concussion might be. Three of us here use a complex sort of knowledge base of signs and symptoms and symptom checklists and physical examination findings. This is a judgment call about return to play, so you as Advocates for your athletes need to demand that your health care provider be current and interested. When I talk to coaches particularly, or I talk to parents, yeah, listen, sports is a great thing. I mean, no one likes sports more than I do. I've made my living around sports and sports medicine. Uh, it's been a, a real uh, sort of gift to be able to see active people and young people be physically active. And there's a lot of health benefits for sports. There's a lot of social development benefits for sports. But really, you know, when you boil it down as, an, as a, an adult in the room, whenever there's a young child and she, he or she are wobbling off the field, at some point you have to ask yourself, you have to say, listen, what's this worth? Is this, really, is this game really worth the rest of the season? Because you could take a young athlete out for the season. Is this game, this eighth grade soccer game, really worth the rest of the athlete's career? If it's their third or fourth concussion and you put one more on them and they don't get better, then it's over. And you always have to keep in the back of your mind that even though it's rare, you have to ask yourself if this injury is really worth the rest of the athlete's life. Because it does happen. They're youth athletes. They're amateur athletes. They're children. Take them out. That's the take-home message there. What I'd like to do, if we have, if the video is going to work, I guess we'll see here, uh, is tell you a story uh, about Zachary Lastet. And Zachary, here's a picture of Zach um, when he played for his middle school, high, middle school uh, football team, 13 years old, great kid. And uh, Zach has become sort of a source of inspiration for many of us. A charming family, and we've gotten to know them, and and uh, they sort of inspired a lot of us. And we did a lot of education work, and then. With the help of the Brain Injury Association of Washington and our institution at Harborview and UW Medicine and our partners at Children's and the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association and the Athletic Trainers in the State of Washington and the Youth Soccer Association and Canfield and Associates who are the insurers for the school districts and some materials from the CDC, we built a big coalition. And we worked really hard to do something which had not been done in the United States. And we worked hard with the, with the legislator and um, worked on a thing called Engrossed House Bill 1824. 
And for those of you who have played high school sports, I think you understand this because you've had to sign an information sheet every year. And we asked that a law be passed that all student athletes and their parents sign an information sheet about concussions. And I'm hoping people in this room have signed that sheet and that the school districts work with the WIAA to find a way to educate coaches and now every coach in the state of Washington has to take a test and he or she have to pass that test about concussion before they can coach every year and we ask for a third thing that any athlete who was suspected of suffering a concussion was taken out of play until they received written clearance from a licensed health care provider who understood concussions to return to play. This was not a law in any state in the United States and uh, there was a great group and many hands made for light lifting and on May 14, 2009, Governor Gregoire sat with the Lystets and all of us who supported them and she signed engrossed House Bill 1824 after she read it to Zach and she said, as of this day, no longer will this be known as engrossed House Bill 1824, it will be known as the Zachary Lystet Law. This was a very emotional day for me. I, in, in one ways, I felt like I was just so proud of the work that we did, but it took the preventable tragedy of this young man to make this law be passed. And we've stayed close with Zach and his family, and he's a very charming young man. And that same coalition began to work, and we got laws passed in seven states. And then we had some help from some new partners, uh, Commissioner Goodell from the NFL, and the American College of Sports Medicine and others, and we continue to work. And I'm happy to report to you that there are now Zachary Lastet laws in 31 states and the District of Columbia, and we are working hard to get all 50. And we think we're going to get five or six more this legislative session. So in honor of this young man, and his one wish as a, as a brain injury survivor is that this never happened to another young athlete Many people are trying to make that wish come true for Zach, and it is a privilege to try to do that. So congratulations to the state of Washington for having the foresight to unanimously pass the Zachary Lastet Law in 2009. And I want to leave you uh, with a little bit of update before we take the questions and answers. Uh, Zach was injured in 2006, and he has continued to work about 40 hours a week trying to get well. Get Let me tell you how Zach is doing now. We, we have stayed close to Zach. Uh, he has become an inspiration for many of us and uh, is a wonderfully challenging, uh, wonderfully challenged young man who has made progress. Nice. You gotta understand, every bit of Zachary didn't work. And there wasn't any part of him that worked. Shift all the way up there, buddy. Good. That was much better. Nice work. You like that step? I did like that step. It took him nine months to be able to talk, and it's taken you know another three years to have him shut up. But it, but anyway, <laughs> it's taken him nine months to learn how to communicate. You know, so we understood what he wanted. Yes, no's. I mean, he could he couldn't he couldn't do any more than that. You know, he couldn't move his head. He couldn't do anything. It's a weird thing, like where I've been and like uh, where I've come from uh, like it's just so unbelievable like I, I can't even believe it and I'm the one doing the work much better Zach mm -hmm. little collapse at the end but overall much better control he's doing physical therapy every day he does different types of therapies when it comes to occupational speech and he does aquatics, he does pushing boundaries. He has a personal trainer he goes to three days out of the week. And then he does school. My future goals, in like a year or two, I plan on being walking a lot more. Uh, definitely walking by graduation. Keep those feet moving, let's go. We definitely wanted Zachary to go to college prior to his injury. But now we're rethinking that. What college are we going to go to? I, I, I don't know. I know what college you wanted to go to before. Um, uh, no, I think you wanted to go to UCLA, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I think you want to go there because of all the girls. But, uh, uh, but we want to talk about No, no, don't do that. So, so. <laughs> nice, dude. <laughs> you can't ask me how proud I am of my kid. You know, because he's, you know, he's really 
he's, he's done a lot, you know, more than anybody would ever be able to do. Uh, I was smart before, and I actually, but I always took the path of, path, ah, I always took the path of least resistance, uh, but now I have to, like, go right through the path of most resistance sometimes, and it's like hard, yes, but I don't give up. Uh, my, my willpower has hopefully, God only knows, uh, uh, but uh, it's more powerful than everything. Yeah, you can clap for Zach. I'll huh? clap for Zach. So, so listen, we, we uh, talk about how hard our lives are. And uh, our lives are not hard. We have the opportunity, all of us here tonight, to do something to make Zach and Victor and Mercedes wish that this never happened again. We, we have a chance to help them with that. And um, last May, I had the privilege of sitting with Mercedes and Victor and uh, the White Center Amphitheater at Tahoma High School graduation when Zach stood up from his wheelchair and walked five or six steps and picked up his diploma. And I tell you, it was pretty electric. And if he, Zach has that kind of courage and dedication, I think all of us involved in brain injury care should have the same courage and dedication to see if we can't help keep sports safe. And uh, we are very grateful that everybody would come out tonight and listen to our story and we are happy to help you if you have the unfortunate circumstance of knowing someone who's had a concussion and uh, appreciate Pacific Science Center and KCTV for letting us have the opportunity. Thank you all and good night. Thank you.